Good evening. Hello. Hello, hello. I think they can hear us. Everyone can hear? All the way in the back? Wave to us. Thank you. Thank you. A warm welcome to everyone that's come this evening. This is going to be a very special occasion because we're welcoming back Eric Reese for the second time here at LSE. And we're going to be able to catch up on all the things that he's done since then. I want to let you know that we will have a format where 30 to 40 minutes, the two of us will have a conversation asking questions and, and discussing them. And then whilst we're doing that, be thinking of things you would like to ask. And we will then take questions and answers afterwards. And then following that, there will be a book signing and an opportunity, if you don't have a book, certainly, to be buying the book and having uh, it signed. So that's the order of what we're going to be doing this evening. So what I'd like to say also is please put your phones on silence and note that there is a hashtag that we have for the evening. And now, a little more introduction for those of you who don't, don't know Eric, but I imagine most of you think you do if you've been reading and following him through the years. Eric started at Yale, computer science. Even whilst he was there, he co-founded a startup for recruiting. Then he went on to there.com, learned quite a bit about agile technology, I believe. Then he co-founded I am the you with the avatars and games that you are probably familiar with. Whilst he was building that, it was the third startup he had been in, he saw that things weren't always as they should be. And as he was a very reflective entrepreneur, he was able to take the things they were trying to do to build this new company, and he would try what in some ways we might call experimentation a lot of hypothesis testing. Now, all of that's familiar to you that have either gone to school or are in school at this point. The idea of taking a question and turning it into a hypothesis and testing it. Well, that sounds very scientific. And in fact, that's what the Lean Startup, the Lean Startup book is talking about hypothesis testing for the concepts of entrepreneurship. But we'll also see that they can be applied not just at the startup phase, but in companies that want to improve their products and have innovation as a part of their culture. So Eric has, after both writing the book, working in the field, he advises probably dozens of companies now, works with venture capitalists, and has been named by Business Week as one of the uh, outstanding young entrepreneurs. He's gone from one area to the next, and I think tonight that we'll hear what you've been learning since writing the book and help you to understand best how you can use these techniques and this methodology. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. It's, uh, it, it's an incredible honor. I had such a good time the last time I was here, and, and it's nice to feel like uh, we're among friends again, so, so thank you very much. Thank you for that very warm, very warm welcome. Thank you. And Eric, since you last were here, can you tell us when you've been traveling or people have been contacting you, if you can see that there's a real momentum of change that this has started? Oh, yes. Um, the best news, I think, for this is I now get contacted by a, a relatively frequent number of people who consider the work in the Lean Startup to be obvious. Uh, and they, they're, they're calling to criticize you know, that I have managed to uh, commercialize something which everyone understands already is obvious. But I take it as the greatest compliment uh, you can have. Because believe me, when I first started talking about these ideas, not only were they not considered obvious, but um, uh, a lot of people, it's hard to, to understand this now, but I used to be asked to come into companies to advise. Uh, be introduced by their venture capitalists, and, and they have me come in. And I, at that time, there was no lean startup movement. There was no conceptual vocabulary around lean startup. It was just me coming in to tell people about the approach that I had used myself in my own career. And 
not only did those conversations not go very well, uh, a lot of them ended with me being forcibly ejected from the room. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. People would actually be so angry as to be yelling at me because what I was describing to them was impossible, couldn't possibly work. It took me a while to understand. And I was like, I don't understand. I'm just, I'm not even, I wasn't even propounding a theory at that time. I was just telling people a story of what I personally had witnessed with my own eyes. Uh, and, and it was one thing to be like, you know, you don't have to do what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what I saw. And they're like, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, that's, that's not true. That's impossible. Um, so we have come a very long way um, from, you know, something that is considered laughably bad to now something that is considered in many circles to be obvious. Uh, I consider a tremendous, tremendous progress. And you can see it, you know, that first of all, that we're having this conversation in this place. You know, I have a few friends in London, but, but not this many. So the idea that these ideas have, you know, and I've had this kind of reception in so many countries around the world, I mean, I, for which I feel very blessed. Um, so we've seen the expansion geographically as these ideas have gone way out of Silicon Valley to all kinds of places. The other really strange thing from my point of view is I, when I wrote in the book, um, I said that uh, entrepreneurship is the management discipline that deals with situations of extreme uncertainty. Sounds good, right? Uh, I was just saying that. You know, I, I don't want to say that I made it up, but it seemed like a straightforward deduction of the theory that I was propounding, that this is what entrepreneurship should be about, and therefore these ideas are applicable in many other situations, not just technology, not just tiny startups, not just Silicon Valley. But I honestly didn't know if anyone would take me seriously. Uh, and of course, I mostly expected that, that they would not, given the experience I had had to date. Um, that's the other kind of expansion that we've seen. People have now taken these ideas, not just globally, but across industries, sectors, and company sizes. So I've personally worked with companies, you know, with, with not just hundreds, not just thousands, but hundreds of thousands of employees. So applied this at huge, massive scale. You know, I've worked on products from, uh, you know, energy products, healthcare, deep sea oil drilling, um, NGOs and government stuff. I was just working with uh, someone from the American government who's trying to save the American bison, which is an endangered species. I mean, really, from the point of view of a technology entrepreneur, a computer science major, quite unusual circumstances. Um, so it's been, it's been really heartening to see that happen. Of course, I'm not the one that made it happen. What, what's it, the most exciting thing to me is, although you know, I get to give the talk and, and people who need to put a face to this thing use mine on occasion, but what is exciting to me is just the grassroots movement that has cooked up around this um, in, in almost every city now that has any kind of startup scene whatsoever. There's a Lean Startup Circle, a Lean Startup Meetup here in the UK. There's many such groups. So, so there's this kind of out of the limelight, uh, you know, army of people who are trying to advance the state of the art in entrepreneurship and doing it under the Lean Startup banner. That to me is the, is the biggest sign of progress that I, that I get excited about. I'm sure that everyone here is eager to hear, if they haven't already heard about it, what a lean startup company looks like. Sure. You've seen lots of them, you said. Now, what, how could you typify them? And in particular, how do they use the lean startup method that, that makes them typical lean startup companies? Sure. Uh, so the first thing to know, if you don't already, is that the lean in lean startup comes from lean manufacturing. So those of you who've studied in business school or in some kind of history of management will know um, that there was a, a system of, of you know, supply chain and factory management that originated with Toyota in Japan, with Toyota production system. That's all about um, using the power of rapid cycle time and a kind of more empirical way of managing to improve efficiency, you know, in any kind of business. And that's a, an industrial legacy that we're, we're lucky to have inherited. The idea for Lean Startup is to take those same kind of ideas about rapid experimentation, about bringing customers into the production process, but apply them to the uh, domain of innovation, startups, and something new. And I said before, startups are, are those companies that exist in a condition of extreme uncertainty, meaning we're not able to make plans and forecasts about the future. We're in a situation where we have best a guess, a hypothesis, um, you know, a, a theory about what might happen in the future. And the recognition behind Lean Startup is everything we do, every product we build, every feature we add, every marketing campaign, everything is an experiment to discover whether or not our theory is valid or invalid. So. Uh, lean startups are all about uh, being built to learn. We achieve what we look for, uh, we try to achieve what we call validated learning or scientific learning about whether our hypotheses are true or false. And you know, that can be applied at the individual founder level. So those of you who are in startups that you are the founder of and you have a business plan and it has you know, a beautiful spreadsheet in the back in Appendix B with that awesome hockey stick, stick shaped curve that's gonna happen in the next five years. Uh, you, know, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but you know who I, I'm talking about. Maybe you have a friend who start up, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, okay. So, 
you know, that's one use case that's very important. You know, what do we have to do? What has to be true for that hockey stick to manifest? Now, when I was an entrepreneur in, in my, early in my career, I just assumed that if you were really smart and you thought really hard and you built the most amazing business plan based on, you know, the most outstanding market research you could get, um, that it was kind of like being in school. You know, you do the hard work and the reward is an A. And so, you know, you get a good grade because you did the hard work because you're really smart. And I thought, okay, well, entrepreneurship will be the same way. If you make a really good business plan, then it's like God himself will make sure that the hockey stick materializes right at the time that you, uh, you discovered. And of course, many of my experiences, the hockey stick, you know, that nice long flat part, we just stayed on the flat part, you know, <laughs> indefinitely into the horizon. That's the more common outcome. So that's, you know, the very classic lean startup are people who are in that situation trying to figure out how do I do that hypothesis testing. But as the movement has grown and the ideas have been adopted more and more places, we're starting to see people who are more than just you know, two people in a garage, but people who are actually getting to what they call product market fit, who actually have a product and customers and employees and are starting to build out an enterprise of significant value. And uh, Lean Startup has a lot of relevance there because although part of an established business is about repeating what we've done in the past, so taking the main product that is our you know, source of success and making it more efficient, optimizing, having that grow. That's like traditional lean manufacturing. That's traditional management techniques where we can make forecasts, right? We want to do what we did last quarter, last year, but slightly better this year. But increasingly, every business faces competitive pressure, not the least of which is from some of you in this room, you know, new entrants who are saying, wait a second, that looked like a pretty good idea. I'm going to copy it, improve it, attack it. You know, for those of us who are brand new, that's pretty exciting. But for those of us who have an established enterprise, one of the things that I think is really important is to realize that we have to always be seeking after new sources of growth. We can't just rest on our laurels and do what we did before. And that, that new extension, when we're looking for new products, new internal processes, new organizational designs, that's an entrepreneurial challenge also. And it's as if you're refounding the company you know, again when you enter into, say, a new, uh, a new product. So a lot of my work lately has been trying to teach companies how do you instill the philosophy of Lean Startup and that kind of approach to entrepreneurial management so that it's something that every employee of the company can take advantage of. Because a lot of people become entrepreneurs because they hate big companies. So like, I don't want to work at some big bureaucratic company where people tell me what to do. I'm going to strike on, you know what I'm talking about? Your friend's company, maybe? Uh, I'm going to strike on my own. I'm going to do everything right the way that I think a company should be run from the start. I always say to my uh, entrepreneurs that I work with the same thing. If you hate big companies so much, why are you trying to create a new one? <laughs> See, what happens is uh, if you build your company to the same obsolete 20th century blueprint that these big companies were built out in the first place, you yourself will recapitulate those very problems that you're fleeing. And I know so many founders with 100, 500, 1,000 employees or more who realize, wait a minute, I couldn't even be hired at my own company. Well, how did that happen? Like, how did I wind up with all my innovation and, and new thinking, how did I wind up building the same old kind of company with its functional silos and its extreme risk aversion that I was trying to, to flee? So a lot of my work now is about trying to help people move just from the thinking about how to use Lean Startup to get started, but to really ask the question, what kind of company are you trying to create in the first place? And how can you build a company that's not just a bureaucratic, you know, old school company, but one that can thrive through continuous innovation. Could you maybe take one startup, though, a concept, and walk us through to where they would have already gotten scaled up and, and have that problem? So could you perhaps walk us through the method a little bit? Sure. So let's start with that business plan that all of you have. I know you have it. It's okay. It's you don't have to, there's no, no shame in that. Everyone has to make a business plan, especially those of us who want to raise money. And the business plan has a spreadsheet in it, I understand. It's necessary, part of the ritual. And the spreadsheet makes forecasts about the future, and that's where it goes off the rails. Because people who normally, in normal society, if you go around claiming that you can predict the future with great accuracy, you'll be committed as insane, right? That's not, you know, that's not something that's normally considered appropriate. For some reason in business, we have an exemption. It's like not only are you allowed to claim that you can predict the future, it's expected. Uh, as a way of demonstrating your confidence in your own ability, uh, which I always found uh, very strange. So the idea of Lean Startup is to take each of the um, assumptions that are embedded in that business plan, we call them leap of faith assumptions, things that have to be true in order for the business to succeed. Like, for example, and not to say one that's too obvious, but that customers will want the product when it is built. Now, I, mean, I hope some of you are like, well, that's just too obvious even to talk about. Like, well, of course, the why would you even do this company if the customer? But, but keep in mind, 
that customers want your product is not something that is within your control. That's a fact outside the building, as Steve Blank likes to say. It's not something that you can just control in your boardroom. So by making those assumptions explicit, we say, well, we got to find out if customers actually want the thing that we're building, so we uh, run an experiment. We call that a minimum viable product, or MVP. The idea is to say, well, instead of spending a year, two years, five years building a product, then launch it, then find out if customers want it. Instead, let's figure out how do we figure out if customers want the product right now, today. So in a lot of cases, we'll do you know, a simple landing page or a brochure that simply asks people to pre-order or pre-register for the product. In other cases, we'll build a simple or easy functional prototype. Uh, in some cases, you know, as we move into more industrial type, type settings, just building the MVP may take months or years. But uh, the for those products, the traditional way of working it might have taken five, seven, or ten years to build the product. So it's about compressing that time to get that first validation uh, as early as possible. And then once we are in market with an actual MVP, then we do what's called the build, measure, learn feedback loop. We try to incrementally and continuously improve that MVP to make it better and better and better, looking for metrics that show that customers actually agree with us that our improvements are, in fact, improvements. That's really the heart of Lean Startup. That sounds very codified, like there's steps that you That's know right. and that you can take. But sometimes we run into situations wh which maybe are outside that. So what kind of advice do you give to people who are trying to go through that stage and then get really confused because they have too many opportunities or not enough opportunities? Uh, yeah. And we'll soon hear your famous word pivot, I'm sure. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, look. Um, so just for the record, Lean Startup is not a religion. Just in case I need clarification, I know uh, I do not have the power to excommunicate anybody and uh, there are no heretics. It's not the kind of thing that it is, so we, a common misconception. Um, here's the challenge. If you read, I mean, almost any business book, certainly entrepreneurial books, they're very step-by-step. -step. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Um, and it really has the power to mislead people. I was misled many times as an entrepreneur. It's, everything seems so clear and simple and straightforward and organized and orderly in these books. And then you go into real life and it's like someone is punching you in the face constantly. And it's hard to keep your thoughts straight. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's excruciatingly difficult and real life is never as simple as uh, it seems like in the book. That's just, that's the reality of it. And the ability to think rigorously in the lean startup way is like a muscle that has to be trained up over time. So it's not that you walk into your startup on day one and you're like, boom, we are a lean startup. We do our hypothesis testing. Like, if you have three or four founders in a room, um, you probably have 12 opinions about what the key hypotheses are. When you get data, I mean, the most classic thing, if you, those of you who have multiple founders, you run an experiment. It's one thing to disagree about what direction you should take next. But in real life, founders will disagree about what the experiment means. Like, we're not even looking at the same set of facts. I think the experiment really well. You think it's a disaster. Now what? So, so real life is a lot more complicated. And these frameworks are there to help us try to make better decisions and to get better at it over time. In fact, those of you who have a science background, this will sound very familiar. If you took a grade school science class, I remember being taught science, you know, in, the, in, in my uh, formative years in my education, I was told, what is science? Science is the scientific method. Step one, problem statement. Step two, hypothesis. Step three, collect data. Did anyone ever, anyone ever taught this way? I was like, science is easy. It's like the easiest subject of all. You just write this stuff down, and, and we would have little experiments that we were taught to do in class. But the great thing is nobody designs an experiment to do in class unless they know what the right answer is. <laughs> so you're like, you know, all you do is figure out what's the answer that the teacher is trying to get us to learn, you know, and then we'll, we'll do the experiment to generate the answer that's already known. But, but you have the great confidence to say the thing I'm investigating is definitely knowable, or my teacher wouldn't have been so stupid as to assign it. Well, real life is not like that. And of course, the real scientists who do real work in the real life say, well, yeah, science is not like, yes, technically that is the scientific method, but you're missing an awful lot. The same thing is true here. We're trying to apply a scientific framework to entrepreneurship, but many of the problems that we're trying to solve are, un are insoluble. So now what? You know, like, what do you do in those kind of situations? And that, of course, comes to the idea of the pivot. This is something that I really didn't understand as an entrepreneur myself for many years. I just assumed that if something is a good idea, it, it should basically work. So when I saw an idea, well, that sounds good, 
like boom, that, that's like sure there'll be some details to be worked out, but like anything that sounds good fundamentally should work. Now most of us have learned the hard way. Um, sounds good are the two most dangerous words in all of entrepreneurship. Most things that sound good are not going to work. And in fact, many things that don't sound good are going to work. I can't tell you how many famous companies I heard about in their early days. You know, Twitter, Facebook, Google, you name it. I was like, that's that doesn't sound good. So you know, it shows what I know. So what we have to do is kind of use these frameworks to get past our own prejudices and biases about what's going to work and what's not, and really be like, we've got to learn to be rigorous and figure out what works over time. And here's the cool part about it. At the end of the day, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial decisions are based on human judgment. You know, some people are like, ooh, science means we're going to turn on to robots and have robots do the startups for us. You just turn the crank and it's all very mechanical. That's a real misunderstanding of what science means. The scientific method is powerful because it can train your judgment to get better over time. So you think about the really great product designers or entrepreneurs, the people you most admire, and ask yourself, how did they come to have such good taste in picking ideas? How did they, how did they get that uncanny intuition about what's going to work? They weren't born with it. They learned it the hard way um, by trying things and discovering what does and doesn't work and having the open-mindedness to change direction when necessary without abandoning the overall vision. That's the definition of a pivot, a change in strategy without a change in vision. And if you're rigorous about that, what you'll discover is that over time, your ability to, to intuit what's going to work gets better and better and better. Just like a scientist, their mental model of how the world works gets closer and closer in line with reality. That's ultimately what we're seeking as entrepreneurs. But that's not a clear cut and dry step-by-step -step kind of a process. In fact, that's probably the hard thing to know whether the evidence that you've now collected mm -hmm. is grounds for, say, a pivot, or, yeah. or do you persevere? And so if you have to make that judgment, again, you were talking about learning this. Yeah. Do you get to a point where there's some heuristics that you are perhaps Absolutely. looking for, and then you start to see a pattern, particularly within your, your own business that yeah. you, you know deeply? And can you maybe give us an example of one that you've worked through where you were not sure whether you should pivot yet and why maybe some of that heuristic that you have you've started to understand yeah. about your own company helped you? Sure. I tell the story in the book about a time that I built a product at InView. In the early days, we spent six months building a product that absolutely nobody wanted. And that was pretty painful, you know, like... It's pretty embarrassing. You know, I was like gearing up for the big launch of this product and I'm like, oh God, I was a chief technology officer. I was in charge of the engineering. I wrote the software with my bare hands. To get it done in six months, you know, corners had to be cut. So, uh, you know, this product would maybe crash your computer. And maybe, if I'm being really honest with you, would say maybe more likely to crash your computer than not. <laughs> so I'm like nervous. We're gonna launch this product and the next day there's gonna be a big article in the local paper, you know, idiots at IMVU don't know how to build quality software. Like never hire this person again, big arrow pointing to my mugshot. Like that's what I had in mind and, and, and everybody knows the story who follows Lean Startup that uh, when we launched the product, I was honestly, I swear to God, relieved that we didn't crash a single person's computer because nobody downloaded the software. <laughs> no, no one even tried it, so you dodged a bullet. I was like, oh, wait a minute. So like, that's like the classic failure that leads to the need to pivot. And, and what I understand now that I did not understand at that time, that situation is a gift. It is a blessing in disguise because it's really, really obvious that it's not working. Now, here's the thing. Again, like comparing the book to reality. In the book, it makes it sound like we launched the product on day one, three days later realized nobody's using it, and three days later uh, we had to pivot. That's because to tell these stories and make them uh, accessible, you have to kind of cut out the messy details. That's just, that's storytelling. The truth is, it took us six months of nobody using the product to realize that we needed to pivot. Six months. Now, who was the most stubborn person refusing to believe the evidence right in front of our face? That was me. It was my software that I had written with my bare hands that we were talking about throwing out. So every tiniest little sign of life. Because like, if actually zero people in the whole world had used our product, that would have been one thing. But it's never exactly zero. We had some customers. We got a few downloads. They just weren't enough. And you know, any time we got more downloads today than yesterday, I'd be like, start of a trend. Here we go. <laughs> Finally, the hockey stick's gonna take. So I was the stubborn person. So, so, but, but like after six months, it was like really obvious that nothing we did made an absolute bit of difference and we had to pivot. The, the entrepreneurs who I really feel bad for are the ones where the results are always up and to the right, but just not quite enough. That's the killer. 
where you just there's just enough evidence to make you want to keep going, but actually you're on a death march and you're just going to go. We, we call these zombie startups, the living dead. They, don't, they won't quite fail, but neither will they succeed. And I know very talented people who are like stuck in such a startup right now. And I'm just like, God, if only they would fail. We get those people out of there. But the, the problem is, is it's just a bug in human psychology, the sunk cost fallacy, right? So the sense of loyalty and determination to succeed actually goes up once you get past a certain threshold. Like you, you kind of, the people who are going to churn out and leave the company and quit in frustration are gone. Those who remain are very difficult to dislodge. Now, the problem is if you read the literature, you will occasionally find a startup that lived in the zombie period for a long time and then it made it. Just like there's, a, you know, there's, I don't know what the right metaphor here is, like there's, you know, there's all kinds of planes that were in a nosedive and about to crash, and then woof, just like you see in the movies, the person pulled up on the stick and we just barely avoided the crash. That doesn't not logically follow that if you are in a tailspin, you're going to be fine. <laughs> like, it, you know, it happened, but like as human beings, we're very optimistic. And so as long as there's a chance of success, you know, we don't want to give it up. So that's, that's really the hard part about, about the need to pivot. And that's why... Ultimately, I'm a believer in the more rigorous and theory-oriented approach of lean startup. Not everyone in the startup world agrees with me. You know, if you walk around Silicon Valley, you can find people who, who do not believe in the lean startup approach that basically believe that it's all about intuition and judgment and, and kind of an intangible, you know, almost like apprenticeship model of this knowledge. It's an arcane, deep knowledge that if you have the right stuff and you're in the right network and you have the right mentors, you can uh, come to understand in a way that you mere mortals, you know, far from Silicon Valley never will. Uh, it's not that you can't be successful that way. A lot of those people believe that because that's, that exact approach got made them rich and famous. Um, but to me, there are a lot of pitfalls that a non-rigorous approach can leave you vulnerable to, and this is one of them. You know, sometimes you get lucky, and the first thing you try just it takes off, and it's the next Facebook, and woohoo. So you know, you, it, those a lot of people running around being like, I didn't need lean startup. I you know, I just did it. And just like there's a lot of people who won the lottery, and like doesn't necessarily imply that you should you know that you'll get rich if you play the lottery, but somebody has to win, so that does happen. The reason I, I kind of give you that long answer is that I think, and if you read the book, I try to lay out this case as best I could, I think there are certain uh, mathematically mod like uh, mathematical models that can help us know with some certainty that it's time to pivot. And they're borrowed from, those of you who studied the history of science, you know, Thomas Kuhn and the whole, uh, you know, um, uh, scientific paradigms theory. Like, there are certain very specific signs that a given paradigm is not going to work. And in particular, that the experiments that you do in that paradigm have become less productive than the alternative paradigm. So you can kind of reach this point of diminishing returns in the experiments that you do. I feel like since I'm at the LSE, this is the kind of thing I can say, whereas in most audiences, I wouldn't dare. It's considered quite academic and, and abstract, but I hope at least a few of you following along and don't mind. Um, so in some ways, a product is a paradigm. Like it's a mental model about what customers really want. And just because the numbers are up and to the right doesn't mean we have the right one. To me, what matters is, are we still getting more increasing productivity over time out of our experiments? And if not, that's the, sh the sure sign that it's time to pivot. But you know, most entrepreneurs are not that rigorous. And so we also have all kinds of easier rules of thumb heuristics that you know, are good enough for those that don't want to go into the, into the arcane stuff. But, but I, I think in this audience, it felt like it was appropriate to kind of get into that. If people want to talk about that more, happy to take questions. But that's, that's really how I think about it. It seems too, though, that you could spend a lot of time doing testing, yeah. but if you aren't testing in the right set of things, then you, again, could be tautological. You think that yeah. it's important. It's not very important. And it does seem like in uh, the method that when you look towards growth triggers in particular, yeah. that then you have you have a certain area that you know that if you're getting bad results, then the, yeah. there's it's really serious. So. Perhaps you could give, again, some examples that would help them to understand it's not just testing the, an hypothesis, but yeah. particularly the growth theories, because that, in the end, as, as everybody that's in business knows, it's yeah. going to be the growth of sustainability of course. that's important. So how to test for growth? Yeah, again, we're, we're having a more abstract conversation than, than is typical for this, this kind of thing, but I think it's important to understand. Um, Here's the trick. When we start talking about learning and validation and science. There's a certain set of people who are excited about that. And then there's a certain set of people who are a little bit too excited about it, if you know what I'm saying. Because they're like, oh, like I know like learning for its own sake and the pursuit of pure knowledge, you know, especially those who have had some kind of academic background, sometimes can get like, well, that would be great. You can get rich doing that. I didn't know. That's, that's awesome. But 
Not so much. Entrepreneurship is an applied science. We're not interested in knowledge for its own sake. That there are important people who do that work. We owe them a great debt as a society, but the entrepreneurs are not them. What we're trying to do is, is find a very practical application of our idea that unlocks, as, uh, as you said in the question, a new source of growth. So what that means is it's important that things that we're testing are things that matter. And see, entrepreneurs have a really bad habit. It's a, a universal bad habit, which is that we love to spend other people's money. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if we're talking about a garage entrepreneur and we're spending the family's money uh, or a venture-backed entrepreneur you know, spending the VC's money or a corporate entrepreneur in, an, in a corporate setting spending the CFO's money. Eventually, somebody comes a knocking and says, hey, I remember that money you spent of ours? Uh, you promised we would be on the cover of magazines and have billions of dollars in revenue and whatnot. And uh, how's it going? And you're like, OK, so remember when I said millions of dollars in revenue? I meant, I meant tens. <laughs> but we've learned a great deal. So you should give me more money. Have anyone ever tried this? It does not go very well. Uh, people who gave you the money, they're like, you didn't promise me learning. You promised me results. So it's important that we have a framework for understanding, listen, what is, is going to unlock the growth? Um, now, I believe in something called sustainable growth, which I think has a very specific definition. Here's Eric's law of sustainable growth. It is growth that happens when new customers come from the actions of past customers. That's that simple. And most companies that I talk to that are having growth don't know if their growth is sustainable or not because they haven't bothered to model it on a per customer basis, which I think is totally nuts. Uh, and it's especially important because I believe you can, with, with this model of sustainable growth, you could make um, the concept of product market fit rigorous. You could actually make it quantitative to say, look, this is sustainable growth happening or not. And the reason that's so great is startups that actually have product market fit are not confused about it. Every once in a while, an entrepreneur will call me up for advice. They say, I'm calling to ask if you can help me figure out if I have product market fit or not. And I always give them the same answer, which is, hey, good news. The fact that you're calling me means you don't. I swear, if you had product market fit, you would not have time to call me to ask me this question. You would be desperately trying to fill the orders that are absolutely clogging up your, uh, your queue. You, know, you think about the early days of Facebook, anyone who's been around a company like that in its early days. There's no time for philosophizing about product market fit. You're just trying to keep the servers up because the demand is overwhelming. Now, that's a great, useful definition, except for if you don't have product market fit, how do you know if you're getting closer to it? Like, what is it? If you're 90% of the way to product market fit, well, you would know it if you saw it. But people who are having 90% of product market fit and people having 10% are basically having the same experience of nothing happening. How can you tell if, you're, if the work you're doing is getting you closer? This is why uh, this concept of sustainable growth is so powerful, um, because it leads to a concept we call engines of growth. There are really three models that I'm aware of where you can get sustainable growth. We call them the sticky, the paid, uh, and the viral models of growth. I won't get into great detail about it now, but if anyone is interested, we can, we can talk about it. Each of them has a certain set of metrics that are critical for showing that kind of compounding growth effect you get when things are really working. And because of that, you can then uh, build a, a kind of a, a yardstick that says, here's our destination. Here's the growth that we're seeking. Uh, here's how close we are to that growth. Now, that's pretty abstract for most startup people. So that this is not, by no means is this the dominant way that people are measuring growth today in startups. In fact, most of the startups I know, uh, if they're very advanced, are looking at like week over week or month over month growth rates. You know, just the, the gross amount of growth that, that is happening and trying to make sure that that number stays positive. And believe it or not, that's better than the alternative, which is just fantasizing about the growth that you'll have in the future. Having a real quantitative hard metric is pretty good. But to me, that's like measuring the exhaust that's coming out of an engine rather than the speed of the car. Uh, and it's not bad. It is like they are, the two things are correlated. So you can do, but like as soon as you start to think about that too much, you're like, but wait a minute. Aren't there things I can do that will increase the amount of exhaust that comes out of the car without actually increasing the speed? Unfortunately, there are. And then could I use that exhaust thinking to raise a lot of money? Yes, you could. And when, could I then use that to generate even more exhaust and raise even more money? And unfortunately, in our current climate, yes, you can. So during the current phase of the entrepreneurial boom, when their money is flowing and there's a huge amount of people raising money in order to be able to raise more money, there's just a, a seduction that comes that kind of pulls people towards this more exhaust gross numbers. We call them the vanity metrics way of thinking. Again, some people are going to get very wealthy following that approach. I don't begrudge them the, the wealth, but I think um, the more rigorous lean startup approach is ultimately going to be better for long-term sustainability, especially uh, because, as they say, winter is coming. <laughs> That, that's a very good description of that area. What I think would perhaps be interesting to some of the students that I, I have spotted out here, 
uh, that are, have their own t projects and testing their concepts is to go to a point in the book that I found was quite interesting, which is when you start out and just have the concept, you don't know all of these other things. You have really no hypothesis other than the concept itself. Mm -hmm. And so could you perhaps help us? There's a project where they would like to know whether the concept is a good one or not. Mm -hmm. How can they test that basically very cheaply mm -hmm. or even completely free? Yeah. And that would be currently a team is looking at real-time tracking of things using a chip embedded, embedded. What kind of things? Well, some days they think some kinds of things, uh -oh, and things. other days oh, yeah. other things. But we, well, sure, because you know, the technology is generally applicable. It absolutely. could be used for pretty much anything. So Am I right? That, so that becomes the part of the team that's like that jumping up and down. Like exactly, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, and the killer is if we test it only to track shoes. Have we just taken our potential market size from like a gazillion trillion dollars to like 25 cents? Because you know what I'm talking about? I'm looking around. They've got to be here. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's continue. So, <laughs> even say that we will take one of their ideas, which, which was real-time tracking of packages. Because right sure. now, if we think of DHL or anyone else, they can tell you it's just been at a particular but where place. Where is it right now? Yeah. And you think, well, that was at eight o'clock this morning, but now it's three, and I'm thinking, where is it next going to be? Yeah. So if you wanted to test the concept, how could you do that without going through the pain of starting to build that and finding out your hypothesis was wrong? People don't really want to pay for that. Yeah, yeah, I feel bad for this team <laughs> because um, technologists have a tendency to want to build general purpose platforms uh, and customers want to buy specific applications. So there's this kind of gap between the two. And there's a, and I'm a technologist who's wanted to build platforms myself, and there's a, a true and deep existential pain that you experience when you try to take your general purpose platform and reduce it down to just one application. It's like severing a limb. You're like, how can you? But Here's the truth. There are no examples, zero, of general purpose platforms being adopted without having a singular application that was developed for them first. And in fact, all the best platforms were refactored out of successful applications. Um, now, that's such a universal truth, like there's plenty of academic research to back this up, plus people's lived experience. Most technologists that I tell that to who are encountering that idea for the first time will be like, I can't believe you. Name me even one, one platform that that's true of. I'm like, I it's true of all the platforms, every single one. So you name me one that isn't. And of course, then we get into like who's right debate. It's like, well, you know, everyone, I got my favorite platform and is that really true? And then we have to debate what was really going on in the early days. It's like, look, educate yourself about this as well, as well understood. But of course, we're in denial about it because it's so painful to contemplate. Here's my promise to you. If you have a successful application with your technology, I promise you will have the opportunity to use that, to build it into a platform and refactor it into more applications. That is the truth. So if you're willing to go show that there is at least one application for your technology or platform, whatever that is, I promise that will go better for you than if you try to publish and sell people on the general purpose platform. Now, it goes back to the difference between, plat between vision and strategy. Remember I said a pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision? This team, I assume, They've got a vision, which is real-time tracking for everything. And they have a strategy, which is start with packages. Now, here's the, here's the thing that people are so afraid of. If I try to make it work for packages and it doesn't, my vision is dead. But what I want you to realize is that's not true. It doesn't work for packages, and we'll try it for something else. I don't know what the things are that need tracking in this world, but whatever they are, we'll try the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And our commitment to each other as co-founders has to be we will try everything that we can try before we abandon the vision. Like, we will abandon only when we have absolutely positively run out of things that might work. Once you're willing to make that commitment, then the, the development of the specific strategy is pretty easy. So who has a problem with tracking real-time packages? I don't know. Maybe it is companies like DHL, in which case, who do we want to talk to to figure out if this is the right thing? Well, what's our hypothesis? Well, one hypothesis is... Um, if a company like DHL had access to real-time tracking technology at a certain price, they would install it across their whole fleet. 
Is that true or not? I have no idea. But sounds like a pretty easy thing to test. You just got to go talk to DHL, show them a brochure that says I have this real time tracking technology at the available at this price and watch them magically install it across the whole fleet. And then when they're in the middle of trying to install it, they'll probably be like, wait a second, where is it? You haven't delivered it yet. And then you're like, oh, uh, uh, sorry, there's been a delay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I can almost guarantee you, you will not have to apologize to DHL because they're not going to want to install your technology. In fact, I don't know where this team is. I don't know who to look at, but like, I got news for you. Talking to a major multinational company and getting them to adopt a new risky technology sounds pretty easy when you're writing your business plan. In real life, is incredibly difficult. So just getting to that basic bit of validation doesn't cost you any money. You don't need the technology. You don't need, you don't need anything but the, the, the relationship with the right person and the ability to talk to them about whether they would like to have your product. Now, when they throw you out of their office is when you got to start thinking about, okay, what else do we need to do? Maybe at that point, you, they would say, like, a great outcome, an amazing outcome would be they're like, um, let, me see the, let me see the prototype, let me see it work, and let me see its technical specifications. If they said that to you, I would consider that a major victory. Then you can go build the prototype, absolutely. But most likely, you're never even going to get far enough for them to ask you whether you have a prototype or not. You're probably not even going to be able to get the meeting. So let's say that hypothetically, you do this, what we just described, you try to get a meeting with a major shipping company and tell them about your risky new technology and you can't do it. You just can't. Then you say, okay, well, we've got to try a different strategy. Now, maybe in package delivery, there are still options, right? Doesn't, there, are, there are other people that have packages in this world. They're not major multinational companies. Maybe one of them might be more likely uh, to try shipping with you. Or maybe you want to take a classic disruptive innovation technique and say, wait a minute, we don't need international shippers anymore. We're, people are going to deliver their own packages by drone. And so, uh, you know, individual people can become their own shipping company in effect. And that, like, I mean, that's funny, but somebody eventually is going to make that work. So I don't care how crazy it is. In fact, the crazier the better from my point of view because then it's like, okay, that creates a very specific hypothesis that we can then go test. And we can go test every permutation of shipping that we can think of and then if that doesn't work, then we're, you know, we're on to zoo animals or whatever the next thing is. Okay, and when we come to the general questions and answers, you can ask him how to test your concept also. Yeah, so happy to. We, we, we discussed this to make it, a type of question of how do you test a concept for a particular idea. Yeah. I'd like to sort of move into the area of what um, the people can do here if they want to learn more. We're, we're really limited by time of how much uh -huh, you'll yeah. be able to talk. And that you've talked sometimes about the Lean Startup movement and that term. So perhaps you could say some of the things that people are doing and also, a little bit about the, how widespread it is, hundreds of cities, as I understand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, some people get irritated when I use the word movement, the lean startup movement, like I'm being pretentious. And that's fair, you know, I, I understand. If I, I, but I honestly don't know what to call it. Um, this was not my idea to have a movement, okay? Honestly, I'm an engineer by training. Like, I, I'm not, I was not trying to start a religion or anything even close to it. I was just trying to tell people a story about what I found useful in my own career, honestly. Uh, a guy named Rich Collins in San Francisco called me up pretty soon after I first started blogging, way before the book was published. He said, I'd like to start a meetup group to discuss lean startup ideas in San Francisco. And I said, I don't think that's a very good idea. So I, I recommend against it. And he's like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. He's a real entrepreneur. He did not care what I had to say. And he's like, you know, if I do it anyway, will you show up at the first meeting? And I was like, no one's even going to come to this meeting. It'll be embarrassing. And I was like, okay, if you get some RSVPs, you know, MVP style, right? Like, put the thing out there. If you get, you know, if five people RSVP, like, I'll come. And the first meeting, I think I had 200 people. It was crazy. And I was like, okay, I guess something's happening here. But I still, and he's like, we've got to have a network of these groups all across the country. I was like, this is San Francisco. There's not going to need to be one in every city. I kept being like, there's not going to need to be one in that city. And then, boom, it's like uh, then it would sprout up. So there's just, there's now thousands, gosh, there must be tens of thousands of people who are members of these groups. Um, and I don't know what to call what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. I'm an author. I publish a book like this. Is, I make a living doing this, being a professional expert or whatever it is that I do. Like, I know that. But, but what, are the, what do you call what these people are doing? Out of the limelight, you know, trying to, like I said, to advance the state of the art in entrepreneurship because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, if that's not a movement, I really don't know what is. London is the home of, and you guys are very lucky, there's some amazing lean startup uh, organizations and events here like Lean Camp. Rich's organization eventually uh, wanted to become the Lean Startup Circle, which has, has a thriving presence here. And, you know, if you just, um, 
you know, on my website and on others, if you just Google for Lean Startup, you can see, um, I, you know, you can't go anywhere uh, in the industrial world and increasingly um, uh, even in developing world without encountering a Lean Startup Meetup if you, if you want to. So that's, that's one awesome way to get involved. There is a Lean Startup Circle mailing list, which has people from all over the world discussing these ideas 24-7. Of course, there's a Lean Startup hashtag for those who are on social media and Twitter. I put on a conference every year called the Lean Startup Conference. The next one will be in San Francisco in November. And of course, you're welcome to come to San Francisco for that. We also offer that conference for simulcast. So we generally have 100 or 200 cities that participate in their own remote live viewing of it. Um, with the time zones, you're not in the worst time zone in the world, but not also not necessarily the best. But a lot of people will stay up all night and just watch it at night. I mean, it's astounding uh, to me. So, uh, and of course, now, like when the book, when this book came out, there were a couple books about it. You know, it was mine and, and others. But now there's like, there's an explosion of books on lean topics. Um, you know, including how to apply lean to all kinds of vertical ideas, DevOps, design, you know, engineering, marketing. Um, there's not one but two different books came out last year with the title Lean Enterprise. So, I mean, if you want to spend money on books and trainings and workshops, there's an infinite amount of that stuff that you can get. There's an explosion of people who have online tools that are supposed to train you how to do lean startup by using this online tool. Um, I'm not really a believer that that approach is going to work, but if someone makes it work, then that will save us all a lot of time and energy, so, so I support the experimentation. Um, but yeah, like at, at this point, the resources are really endless, and I think, if anything, we have the opposite problem, which is it's very tempting and very easy to get lost in kind of analysis paralysis and education mode and forget to actually do your startup. So please, don't, don't, spend this, no, don't spend a year reading every book and then start your startup. Like, get started. And then as you have actual problems, like try to find the resource that will solve those problems. You know, action is much more important than, uh, than talking. And uh, that goes for my book as well as for any others. You know, I, I'd much rather you be doing your startup than reading a book about it. And only if you find the book helpful in solving the actual problems you real have, you have in real life, um, is it worthwhile all this other work that we do. What do you plan to do with the announcements that you made recently in February for sort of, it was just a short announcement yeah. saying, watch for Kickstarter. So what, what are we to make of that? What, what yeah. is your next future thing? What's, what's today's date, anybody know? Today's the sixth. The sixth, all right. So here's my problem. Uh, I have agreed to launch something new in 10 days on the 16th at South by Southwest. Uh, I want to make a big announcement and splash about it, which means if I tell you about it right now, then I will have undermined my goal of having a big launch in 10 days. Do you understand my problem? So, but, so between us, okay, I'm not going to launch anything today. I, as far as your concern is, right, anyone, I didn't announce anything. Is that, is that right? Okay. However, uh, I am going to do this Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it is because I've decided to write a new book. So don't go live tweeting that right this second, if you could be so kind. Um, I am going to write a new book. And what I've decided to do is the new book will come out not for several years, because it's a traditionally public book. A published book, it will be the successor to Lean Startup, be published by Crown uh, and Penguin here in the, in the UK. But I wanted to do an MVP myself, to do some experimentation with some of the ideas and research for the book. And so I'm going to launch a Kickstarter campaign that will be um, supporting that research process. Now, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, because I just explained why, yeah? But can we put that URL up on the screen? Uh, I asked my team who's working on the Kickstarter to, to arm me with a special page where you can put in your email address and be the first to find out about the campaign when it does go live in 10 days. And hopefully it's on the screen behind me. So lean startup dot, the leanstartup.com slash Kickstarter. Um, you can see that we're being intentionally vague about what it is that you're signing up for. I promise it's something that you will find interesting. Um, and, you know, and the reason I wanted to do that, I, I swore I would never write another book. It was so painful to write this one. But... Um, you know, when I, I talked about how when Lean Startup, I was first talking about it to people, people thought it was crazy. And then it was a crazy phase. And then there was this phase where people would say, well, okay, that sounds good, but, and they would be like, what about Lean Startup as it applies to X? And in those days, the questions were like, what if, you know, what if I'm not making an app? Well, oh, gosh, this is pre-app probably. It's like, what if I'm not just making a website, but I'm making enterprise software? What about that? And what if I'm making a video game? And what if I make, like, can you do an MVP of this, of this, of this, of this? People had questions like, what specific analytics do I use here? Or what do I do? Like, and there's a wide variety of situations. Should I pivot in this situation or that? Should I, how do I get my team on board? How do I get my engineers on board? How do I get designers? So it's like a huge number of questions that in the early days, 
I really didn't know the answer to. I'd be like, well, here's my best guess at what we should try. Let's go run the experiment together. And so we kind of, uh, as a community, built up mastery of this set of ideas. And eventually, I was answering the questions over and over again. Got to the point where I was being asked the same questions over and over again. I was answering them. I was like, gosh, it'd be a lot more efficient if I didn't have to convince people about this one person at a time. You know, I could start to do it in mass. And then I was like, okay, a book could be helpful there. So now that people have started to apply Lean Startup at scale, I feel like we've gone through kind of a similar effort the past, I don't know, three or four years. The first couple times I was asked to do this with an enterprise, you know, with more than a few hundred employees and then eventually thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands, like questions come up that, you know, like what about industrial products? What about healthcare products? What about regulated industries? What about how do you change the HR systems, IT systems, finance systems to support people being entrepreneurial in companies? And the first times I got those questions, I really didn't know the answer. Now I get them all the time and I felt like, okay, I'm answering the same question over and over again. Like, maybe it'd be more efficient to, to not just transform companies one at a time. So, so I feel like there's a body of work that, that I'm excited about uh, to talk about kind of in that next level of detail. Like what happens after product market fit? What happens if you want to uh, have your company be transformed by these ideas? And how do we as founders avoid that curse of building an old, dumb, bureaucratic company that we were trying to flee in the first place? So that's kind of a not announced, not launched sneak preview of what is to come. <laughs> Fair? We, we have an understanding between us? Thank you. And, and we really look forward to learning a little bit more in just a few more days. Yes, so. anyone who's going to be at South by Southwest, there'll be a launch party. You're all invited. Um, and we will live stream the uh, announcement itself, so, so stay tuned. So this is the first sort of interaction between the, the, the crowd and you. Um, and the next is our Q&A. And uh, we'll take questions from anyone. And they can be uh, questions that are about your own enterprise as well as just general questions. Yeah. And what we will have to do is make sure that you do get did everybody get the URL? Get, get the, Anyone didn't get it who want it? Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Get good. the mic to you before you start speaking. And we will try to do this as fair as possible. It's always hard with many hands up. And I'll have to describe what you're wearing. <laughs> okay? So I will take the gentleman with navy and blue there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is basically, should we all leave London? Um, the reason why I ask this is because I've been reading about other, um, um, how can I say this, smart people who know about startups. And some of them say, you know, to launch a startup, you really have to be in one specific location. You have to be in, for example, Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I know there are a few startups that have succeeded outside of the States, but maybe they're just, you know, exceptions. Sure. So in your opinion, do you think um, us in London can actually achieve great startups as well and other people in Europe, or should we really be based in one in a different location? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fair question, and, and I don't know, London seems like a wonderful city, so I wouldn't want to leave it either. Uh, but I, I'm, this is a tricky question, and I, and I want to give you a really honest answer, which is I live in San Francisco for a reason. Okay, that I, I, chose, I was not born there, I chose to move to San Francisco, I make that my home, and I love it there. There's something very special about Silicon Valley. Um, it's like Hollywood in that entrepreneurship is, is, the, is the, it's, our, it's like a company town. Our business is entrepreneurship, that's, that's what we do, that's what people obsessively are talking about all the time, and the massive resources that we have compounded over many years in Silicon Valley are at the disposal of the entrepreneurs that work there. So it's a wonderful place, and any of you who want to come visit, you know, I strongly uh, uh, encourage you to do so. Wearing my hat as an American citizen, I would love for you all to relocate and build your startups in the U.S. and have all those jobs and economic development happen in the U.S. That would be wonderful. But taking off my hat as an American citizen and putting on my hat as a citizen of the world, like, there's some problems with what I just said. First of all, the fact that I selfishly want you to do that shouldn't matter to you. Um, I think that as startups become increasingly important for economic development generally, we're going to need, it's not going to be optional, we're going to need thriving startup hubs in many parts of the world. I think every country is going to have to make this an, a part of their national program of economic development, and anybody who doesn't will be left behind. So um, that's pretty important. The second thing is Silicon Valley is a state of mind, not a place, really. Like there are certain things about the way that people pursue entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley that I think are universally applicable. And if you can build a culture around those things, 
Um, that's more important than being in the physical place uh, of Silicon Valley. Now, some of the things are things that, of course, I, I mean, I, I, as a lean startup evangelist, I, I advocate for a very specific kind of entrepreneurship. But um, I take for granted the kind of prerequisites that, that any good startup hub would have, namely the kind of transparency and openness and the sharing of ideas, um, the investment, like the idea that if you make uh, money as an entrepreneur, you're going to pay it forward to the next generation by investing in their companies, the importance of equity ownership, um, the, the idea, like the public policy things that are necessary to get right in a startup hub, and especially when I'm in Europe, I hear a lot about the problem of personal liability uh, for companies, which is just crazy to me. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, have to, that, that are very important, but if you can get those ingredients together in a, a locale, I think you can build a thriving startup hub, and from what I hear, London is, is proof positive that that can happen. The other thing is that the physical place of Silicon Valley is myopic. We are fad-driven just like Hollywood. So, you know, drones is the thing. Bitcoin is the thing. Like if you read TechCrunch, you'd be like, why, how could, how, why did 25 identical startups get, start, get funded in February? Like, how did everybody get the memo that this is the thing to do? But like, that's what it means to be in a company town. Like, there are some disadvantages to that. So if you're doing something outside the mainstream of Silicon Valley, it can be hard. We have problems with meritocracy and bias. You may have read in the paper of late of which I am not going to comment today. I already got asked by the BBC. I've had enough of, of putting my foot in my mouth on that topic. But it's, a, it's an issue. Like There are certain people and certain uh, backgrounds that don't get what I think of as the, um, as, the right, as the right hearing. So it's not so easy to just show up in Silicon Valley and start raising money there. It's only open to certain people, uh, unfortunately. And the other thing is that there are different kinds of startups and, and Silicon Valley is very much geared for a very specific kind, what we've lately been calling unicorns, which I think is funny because that's a fictional mythological beast that doesn't exist in real life. I think that is like a deeply revealing psychological tick <laughs> about Silicon Valley. But in any event, we're looking for a very specific kind of hyper growth, high margin, super defensible, um, uh, take over the world type startup. That's not the only kind. And um, I think that if you're not trying to do that, then there are other places that might make more sense. Not to mention there are certain industries where there's expertise around the world. You know, if you look at the startup scene that's thriving in New York, there's a reason why finance and media startups are doing so well there. So, so I think there's a lot of ways and a lot of different reasons to be somewhere different than Silicon Valley, even though, of course, I personally would like you all to relocate uh, as soon as possible. So I think, I think, honestly, this is a question that every founder has to answer for themselves. Like, what is the place and the network uh, and the kind of set of relationships that helps you be the most successful. And what I would encourage you to do is don't be, don't have inertia about it. If you're not sure, go see for yourself, just like we with anything else in Lean Startup. Go see with your own eyes. If you're not sure if Y Combinator is for you, like come to Silicon Valley and take a meeting. Like, check it out. A lavender purpley top. <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for the talk. It's very interesting to hear your views. Um, my name is Leah Choi from Marybelle Property. Um, I would love to get your view on strategic partnership. Now, the ideal situation is that you are you have you're coming from a position of strength and you have this kind of on par partnership with um, anybody in the business. But there is a world in which you may not have that position of strength and you may want to have a strategic partnership because you want to learn and you want to do something a bit better. But then again, you might be forfeiting maybe some of your rights into the company and the business and so. So in the lean startup sort of um, framework, I mean, have you, can you share us your view on what strategic partnership might mean and when it's a good idea, when it's not? Thank you. Oof, that's a tough topic. Um, most of the time, uh, partnerships in the startup context are a disaster. I mean, just an unmitigated disaster. And, and, it's, and there's two kinds. There's partnerships between startups and then the partnerships, there are asymmetric partnerships between a startup and a big company. Now, most of the time means that some of the time it's a really good idea. Like, I don't know, my favorite one is probably the, partner, the, the partnership between Microsoft and IBM early in, in a Microsoft's life, where they stole the crown jewels from IBM and created a, you know, one of the world's largest companies off IBM's mistake. So every once in a while, the kind of asymmetric warfare that startups engage in can be awesome. But a lot of people think they're Bill Gates who ain't. You know, that's like uh, second only to people who think they're Steve Jobs. But, but, but are not. So I would be extremely wary 
of making the mistake that I see so many founders of, of believing there's this silver bullet partnership that will save you. The problem was, so there's two problems. One of the problem with partnerships between startups is in order for a partnership to succeed, both of the individual partners have to succeed. So in order for a partnership between startups to work, you have the probability that, start, that startup A survives times the probability that, that startup B survives times the probability that the partnership is really a win-win. That's a lot worse than just the probability that A survives, which is pretty low to begin with. So like you take infinitesimal times infinitesimal times infinitesimal, and now you're talking about really low, you know, like, geez. And of course, all the time and energy you spend negotiating the partnership is time you didn't spend trying to serve customers. Now, in the case of a, I can't tell you how many startups I know that die waiting for the big company. It's like waiting for Godot, right? It's like, we're almost to yes with this big company that is going to put us in their distribution centers and it's going to do all this amazing. And big companies are awesome at sweet talking you and telling you all the great things they're going to do for you if you just jump through one more hoop for them. Um, I've seen a lot of companies that absolutely just die waiting to get through that next hoop. And the truth is, and I wish this wasn't true. I wish I wasn't about to tell you this, but I think some big companies do this on purpose because it's like, hey, I could put a, I could put a bullet right through the head of a competitor. It's easy. You know, and instead of telling them your idea sucks, get out of my office, which would galvanize you and make you feel like, ah, oh, I'm going to show them. But like, your idea is great and we would love to invest in this and this. Hey, but, um, you know, this presentation is not professional enough for us to take the board. Could you prove it a little bit? These metrics aren't quite good enough for us. Could you make sure that this vanity metric is a little bit up and to the right more? Like, think about all the hoops you got to jump through and you ask yourself, the energy I put into that partnership is that time that's really, really helping me understand what customers want. And then this big dumb company, are we sure that they know what customers want? I mean, they're very confident, but like, do they actually know? Like a classic thing is retail distribution. People who want their widgets sold in, in stores in the US, it's all about getting into Walmart. Um, and I've spent time with Walmart and their top executives and like, they know their customers pretty well. But if you're trying to do something disruptive and new, do they re are they really able to estimate or guess what your what customer like? I don't know. I wouldn't have such faith in them. So there there are the occasional startups that absolutely have to have strategic partnerships to work. Like I'll tell you an example. I have a, a company that I've invested in that has a brilliant, absolutely brilliant idea to make the Internet of Things easier. I will get into it. It doesn't matter. But it's a very clever idea to make it so that when you like buy a connected light bulb or a device you turn it on in your home, it automatically connects to your Wi-Fi and it automatically connects back to their servers and gets configured and you don't have to do anything. So imagine that, you don't have to type in any commands, there's no SSID, there's no security, like nothing, just boom, like magic. And in order for that to work, um, it's a like very partnership intensive thing where you, the devices and the people who make the Wi-Fi routers and all these people have to have like, there's all this coordination that's to happen on the back end. And because the person who's the founder of this company is really good, at negotiating those kind of partnerships and is, uh, has a background in business development and has the credibility to get those meetings and get those companies to yes, like I'm a believer that this person may be you know, a future Bill Gates. But you know, not everybody has that background and that skill set and not every business really requires that kind of, uh, of kind of coordination. And here's one more thing. A lot of businesses that ultimately are gonna need those kind of partnerships even so, you'd be better off proving that customers really want your product before you talk to the partner so that you can be from a position of strength. Um, so even when partnerships are strictly necessary, I still would rather you build an MVP uh, and talk to customers in most, but not absolutely every case. Harry, back row. Um, good evening, uh, my name is Charles. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation and for being uh, here at the LSE. Uh, the, que the question I want to ask you is, um, do you believe that it's possible for a young uh, starting entrepreneur to, um, to be working in different uh, uncorrelated projects at the same time? And if you do, um, maybe would you have any advice on how to do so efficiently? And if you don't, then why is it not possible? Thank sure. You. Well, we know it's possible because people do it. Uh, now, is it the, is the optimal strategy for success? I'll tell you a funny story. Everyone knows Mark Zuckerberg, right? And you, everyone saw the movie about Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, you know the social network, right? You know that famous scene in the movie where they move out to that house in Palo Alto from Harvard and they're all like playing in the house and, there's, and, and they, ran, they literally run into Sean Parker on the street and it's like, oh my God, and he comes and moves into the house. Everyone knows that? 
That really happened. That's historical. That, that, I know where the house is. It's a real place. Uh, they really did do that. What is not covered in the movie is my favorite part of the story that I'm sad that they omitted. So who was living in the Facebook house at that time? Mark Zuckerberg, Adam D'Angelo, their CTO, eventually the founder of Quora, Sean Parker, Dustin Moskovitz, now the founder of Asana, uh, and two other guys. Now, this is a, this is a high-powered group. I mean, their net worth collectively today is I don't even know, but those are some pretty amazing entrepreneurs. In the movie, it doesn't say, it, the implication of the movie is that they're all working on Facebook in the house. Oh, no. <laughs> Several of them, including Mark Zuckerberg and Adam D'Angelo, have moved on from Facebook, not convinced that it's going to be a success. I mean, they're still sort of working on it, but they are multitasking. These are future masters of the universe, so brilliant entrepreneurs, the greatest of all time, on one of the best businesses of all time, that's past business plan. They are in schools right now. It is happening. They are about to make billions of dollars. What is Mark Zuckerberg working on? Uh, an app called, I think it was called Wireshark for peer-to-peer -peer file sharing or something. Adam D'Angelo is working on some kind of app where you can co program your computer by using gestures in front of a camera so you don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> The only reason Facebook exists today at all, as far as I can tell from what I understand of the story, is that Dustin Moskovitz, who did not know how to program, was like answering the customer service emails from the thousands of schools that were constantly emailing them, you please bring Facebook to my school. Zuckerberg and D'Angelo, none of those guys could be bothered to program the new schools because they're on to new things. And so Moskovitz taught himself to program so that he could learn enough PHP to be able to turn on additional schools. And he eventually was doing it so often. Eventually, Sean Parker or somebody had the insight, you know, maybe this Facebook thing is going to, they got it gradually, not even over, like no, gradually over time, uh, they abandoned their other side projects and decided to focus on Facebook. Geniuses, they obviously were. I'm sure if you were there, you would have known. I know. <laughs> so this has made me very reluctant to answer your question and say that, no, you shouldn't have a side project because it can happen. Here's my concern. My concern is that um, some, some products and services pretty much sell themselves and can grow through viral growth like Facebook did. And so even with neglect, it can kind of, the, the product market fit will hit you over the head until you finally realize it. Um, but there's a lot more that just aren't like that, that require sustained individual focus in order to discover what is going to work and the pivots that are required. Um, and so my worry is that the research on multitasking is that humans are not very good at it. And if you're working on too many different things at once, will you really have the focus necessary uh, to figure out when to pivot? But that doesn't mean only do one thing at a time. What it means is just be self-aware are you giving each of your projects the attention that it really deserves? And my problem that I had as an entrepreneur is I'm not very good at saying no. So I always wanted to hedge my bets and kind of have a, my fingers in a lot of different pies. And that was actually very detrimental to me as an entrepreneur because um, the ability to say no is one of the most important entrepreneurial skills. So I wasn't practicing the thing that I really needed to learn how to do, which is to focus my energy on the things that, that I really wanted to be working on that were aligned with my vision. What I would ask yourself is, how many visions can one person have, truly? If everything that you're working on is part of a vision that you personally feel really passionate about, then like, okay, I'll accept it. But my experience wasn't like that. I had like one project that I was really passionate about and five other projects I thought were pretty dumb, but I was like, but what if they succeed? I would have been that guy, you know, who was there at the time and said no. And that's happened to me a lot. I'm, I'm a terrible judge of early projects personally. I had the chance to work at Facebook and Twitter and Google and all these companies very early and I turned down every single one. So, I mean, the amount of money I have almost made. <laughs> staggering. And I, and I went through a long period of anguish about it, and I eventually realized that if I wanted to make a lot of money, I would have become a banker. You know, I would have gone work at Goldman Sachs or something. So, like, that's not the right scorecard for me to pay attention to. And then, you know, because I was saying, well, what do I actually really care about? What, what's, what's the right vision for me personally to be invested in? That ultimately is the question that led me to doing what I'm doing now. And I'm like, well, thank God I didn't make all that money at Facebook. There's no chance I would be doing this, and this is way better. So what I would say to you is, you know, everything you're doing, make sure it's vision aligned for you. And anything that's not, let it go. Brilliant. Over there. Thanks. Um, I've just started a charitable organization called Young Humanists, which is definitely not a religion like yours. Um, and I also work in disability um, campaigning. So I'm interested to know how your ideas um, 
apply to non-commercial ideas. Yeah. Um, and so could you maybe give an example of an NGO that you've worked with on a social issue? Sure, yeah, I, I, I love that question. Um, there's, as people think that there's a lot of difference between nonprofits uh, and for-profits, but most startups are what we call, um, I like to call what you're talking about intentional not-for-profits. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot in common with, with, with the rest of us who are, you know, the unintentional not-for-profits. <laughs> It's really the same problem over and over again, which is in the absence of revenue, what can you use to measure progress? Now, some of us are deluded to thinking the revenue will show up magically by itself. And a lot of people in the not-for-profit world are expecting that foundations will magically show up and provide the revenue. So how is that so different than thinking that customers will buy your product? To me, it's the same. And the reason it's the same is that um, we talk about serving your customer, understanding customers, customer development. It, it really should always be customers, plural. Every product, every startup has multiple customers that it serves at the same time. And the goal of the customer development, the research, the MVPs is all to figure out, like, can we build a product that works for all the different stakeholders simultaneously? Like, you know, and, and a, to choose a trivial example, like, you know, a media-driven startup like Facebook, just we were just talking about it, you have this question of, like, you need a product that consumers want and that advertisers want. You need a Venn diagram. Think about all the products that consumers might want, all the products that advertisers might want. You need to say, hey, is there any overlap in this Venn diagram or is it headlights? Most startups, unfortunately, they sound good, but the two circles are far apart and there is no overlap. And some products is even more complicated. You think about like a YouTube. Not only do we have people who watch movies and the people that pay for advertising, but we also have the people who create the movies and upload them. We have to find a single product that works. It's like we're playing n-dimensional chess pretty fast. Same issue with not-for-profits where we have some strategy, some plan for how the thing will be funded. And then usually the people that we serve and sometimes we have government agencies and sometimes it can be quite complicated. Um, there's actually an emerging group of people who, who have created a group called Lean Impact, which is all about uh, lean in the social sector. And I would really encourage those of you who are working in the social sector to, um, to take a look. Um, they have a ton of really great case studies. At, at one of our conferences, Kiva presented. They're a great example of, of really revolutionizing the way that philanthropy is done. Um, there's also a lot of government agencies that we've had adopted that also have similar, similar challenges. And I'm trying to think now off the top of my head of a good a good story to tell um, uh, about an NGO, but I'm kind of blanking because I'm trying to think about it too hard, and I'm sorry. Uh, but check out the Lean Impact. They have a lot of great case studies. And again, the issue is really about how do we know, how can we prove that um, the, the service that we do for individual people is valuable enough for funders to want to fund us in a sustainable way. Uh, oh, I, I got an example. It finally hit me. Uh, there was a... Um, uh, a nonprofit that was working on, uh, this is, it was, it's a little complicated, I'm like, I'm not gonna get all the details right, but it was a reforestation idea where uh, in certain parts of the developing world that have been deforested, um, we would teach people to grow a new, like to basically reforest their area and farm the forest to make a living doing that instead of burning down trees. So trying to turn trees into a profit center for this local area uh, in the developing world. And the plan when I talked to them was they would raise money from foundations and they would plant these trees. And that was just a tiny eh, little problem with the thing, which is that the trees take 25 years to grow. <laughs> so you wouldn't really know if the thing was probably they're gonna have people plant seeds. And then that was just like, oh boy, right? That's gonna be really, and they were like, so we can't do MVPs, we can't test. We just have to plant a gazillion trees. And so, of course, you can imagine having a little bit of difficulty raising money to plant all these trees when no one knows that this thing is gonna work. And so that was one of the questions, like how do we turn that from this crazy big five-year plan, this 25-year plan, how can we demonstrate that the, the idea is viable, what's the MVP? And I remember talking to them, I said, well, do there exist any of these trees fully grown in the world? And they're like, sure. I was like, can they be transplanted? And they're like, well, like, at tremendous cost. I was like, but tremendous cost per tree, they're like, yeah, it would be a lot more expensive per tree than to put the seed. I'm like, I know, but the total cost to build one farm is what? So they're trying to raise millions to plant all these millions of seeds, but actually to, to transplant a single tree is not that expensive. I don't remember what it was now, it was like $1,000. So we're like, okay, could we find one community that we reforest with grown mature trees and demonstrate the economic model so that we could go to agencies and say, look, we've taken uh, not every community in the whole world, but one community. We've taken them from dependence to independence in this ecologically sustainable way. We'd like your funding to do too. 
and then three, and then 10, and then 100. And then, so like a completely different model that starts small and scales up. Now, the difference between this and kind of the traditional nonprofit pilot project is the plan from day one was to make sure that it was scalable. So instead of um, going to funders and saying, we'd like you to give us money for a pilot project, the key is to go to them and say, if I can show you these metrics, will you commit to me to give me the money to scale it up 2x? And then that's the conversation you're having. Is you're not trying to get from zero to a million. You're just like, how do I get from x to 2x? Or how do I get from five to 10 or one to two? Like, how do I get that initial funding going? And, and it requires funders really to think in a different way. So to me, it moves the risk. Instead of saying, okay, well, maybe the funders will materialize eventually, we're saying, no, up front, the first thing we're going to do before we plant a single tree is make sure we have at least one funder that's prepared to back us in this incremental way. Is that helpful? Blue, right there. Hi, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank My you. question is about uh, what happens before Lean Startup. So to apply your methodology, you need an idea or an opportunity. And how, if you want to be an entrepreneur, do you find this idea or this technology? Where do you get the idea? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If I could answer your question, you know, I wouldn't be, wait I wouldn't be answering your question. I'd be having the idea. I'd be making all the money. You know, this is going to sound a little bit weird, but I got into entrepreneurship strictly by accident. I was in college when the dot-com bubble hit, and everybody was being an entrepreneur. And I was like, ooh, that's cool. I'll do it too. I didn't have the first clue what it was. And if you'd asked me at that time why I was becoming an entrepreneur, I would have been like, well, I don't know. It's just it's what people do. I, don't, like, I see it in magazines that people making all this money and all this cool things happening. Like, I had no vision, absolutely no idea what I was doing, and that led me astray in a bad way. So this is going to sound a little hypocritical, but I, I don't think you should aspire to be an entrepreneur. Like, I think you're much better off becoming an entrepreneur when you have a vision for something that you're super excited about. And then you're like, I have to make this thing. I, I can't live without it. But that's different than saying, I would like to have a career as an entrepreneur. That, I think, is very noble. But if your, job is, if your goal is to have a career as an entrepreneur, then uh, it may not be the best first step to just start a company based on an idea that you're not passionate about. It might be better off, you might be better off apprenticing yourself to an existing entrepreneur, like going and taking a job at a startup that you really admire or even developing some kind of deep domain expertise in a technical field that you have a lot of passion for. So I only was able to become an entrepreneur because I've been programming computers since I was a baby. I mean, like, it's like the earliest memories I have of, uh, is of uh, programming early PCs. That's all I ever wanted to do as a kid. I was shocked when I found out you could get paid for programming. <laughs> I had no idea. Like, it was better than playing video games to me. I would have done it for free. People pay you to do it. I was absolutely floored. So I thought I was going to be a programmer my whole life. And because of that, by the time I became a software uh, entrepreneur, I had tons of deep, deep domain knowledge about actual software development that made it possible for me to do stuff that otherwise would have been impossible. So, you know, it's tricky. Like, if, if you don't have something like that that you're that passionate about, either as an idea for a business or as an area of technical domain, then, like, I will, I'd be concerned for you. And what I actually would say is either, like, like a lot of people are always like, should I go to college? Should I get a liberal arts education if I want to become an entrepreneur? Now, I went to Yale. You know, I, I, was, I got a liberal arts education. I'm a big fan of that. I, the people I meet who are, are uneducated as entrepreneurs, not, not that they can't succeed, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I see them struggle with um, concepts that those of us who have had the privilege of an elite education take for granted. And I'm a big believer uh, in that. I'm very glad that I had that opportunity. Um, now, I, now, if my startup had worked out, I would have dropped out. So I'm lucky that my startup failed and I went back to school, you know. But like I said, I had the, I had the first half of the movie, The Social Network Experience. <laughs> quite had the second, did so much have the second half, but, but it was looking good uh, right up until it didn't. So I don't know what to tell you. Now, there, there are, now, now, that's partly because like, this isn't really my field. How to come up with good ideas, creativity, development. Like There are people who, who have way better advice to give you than that. I think Tina Selig, who teaches creativity in the engineering school at Stanford, has a whole book on the topic. So she, she's, or maybe it's, that book maybe is coming out, and I've read it in a galley. I'm not sure. Um, but that's a great book. Um, you know, Paul Graham has a very famous essay about how to, how to get startup ideas. 
So, you know, the people who really study this, I would defer to them. When people come to me to work on Lean Startup, generally they're already, like, they're already too committed to a specific idea. My goal is to help them develop some humility about it. I, I don't have any special track record at coaching people to create a new idea. I can only tell you what my experience was. Hi, Eric. Very nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm working on a startup with my business partner. Am I at the top? Say hello. Um, as, as exactly, as uh, we're starting at the moment, as you, you mentioned, um, when you have an idea, you become very stubborn. You know, you love it so much that you yeah. don't want to let go and you want it to make it successful. Um, my question is regarding that uh, test stage. When do you say, no, it's not working and you have to move on? Yeah. Uh, the reason why is because I've heard the stories. Uh, a guy going to investors, you know, 50 investors, they said no. Mm -hmm. the the, you know, when he get, got to 50, he actually got the money, yeah. you know, and he gets to that point, you know, he actually believed so much in the idea that he went through all of that, but when he's, he's yeah. so, uh, you know, so new, how do you know when to say, okay, get rid of it and start another one? You guys had this conversation recently? Is it possible? No. No, you haven't? It's you and your co-founder haven't? She's, she's nodding, so I'm just wondering. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm not picking on you. I'm not picking on you. It's okay. I just I know that entrepreneurs never ever ask hypothetical questions. I just know it. It's like my friend has a startup and uh, this thing is happening. And listen, I feel your pain. <laughs> I personally have been there so many times. And um, here's how. This is what it used to look like for me. Maybe you guys are different. My co-founder and I. Um, I tended to be the practical nuts and bolts implementation guy, and I tended to be partnered with the visionary uh, kind of head in the clouds type, and we would, and he would say to me, uh, customers don't know what they want. So if you go around asking customers questions about what they want, they don't know, no one would have known, well, he would have said the iPhone, but this is before the iPhone, but I don't you know, if you never asked, Steve Jobs never would have asked, and if you'd asked Henry Ford, and the whole, like all those, like he just cliche this, cliche that, we gotta believe, and through belief and determination, we can make it, and I would say, um, that's great, but um, you know you can't eat vision. You can't, you know, like we need proof that this is going to work, and we got to figure out. We got to actually make translate this concept into an actual product that people would want. And so we need to test, experiment, look at data. And he would say to me, "Listen, if all we do is try to make the numbers go up into the right, our business will have no soul, and we'll be selling pornography before long." You know, we got to. <laughs> and we used to just we would have this argument every freaking day every day and we were ready to kill each other constantly and what I wish someone had told me then and what eventually we came to understand begrudgingly was both of us were right. We, we were confusing two different things. We were confusing the vision with the strategy. The, the determination that is necessary to see a startup through requires a real commitment to something where you say, look, this is the core of our idea that we got into this to do and nothing will allow it, they will never sacrifice this. But the specific strategy we have in mind is disposable. If it's not right, we want to find that out before it's too late. We have the opportunity to pivot. So our goal is to find that synthesis between what our vision is and what customers can accept. So we don't ask customers what they want. You can read my book a hundred times. You will never find the recommendation to ask customers what they want. I don't believe in it. Customers don't know what they want. That's a true fact. But imagine I was a physical scientist and I was in here and I was like, I'm trying to do chemistry, but fuck, electrons don't know what they want. And I can't do a focus group with the electrons, so forget it. And you'd be like, this person is deranged. The like, point is to measure how customers behave to find out if it's the way we think they will behave. And the great thing about having a passionate belief, the more passion you have for your idea, the more falsifiable your hypothesis is. My favorite entrepreneurs are the ones that think their product will be, be loved by everybody. It's such a good idea, everybody will want it. It's teleportation. And who wouldn't want, you know, who wants to commute to their office when they could teleport like that? It's like, oh, great. What I love about a product that everyone is going to love, it's also logically true that 10 people will love it. Right? That's just a subset. So because everyone's going to love it, let's go see 10 people that love it. And if you were actually trying to sell teleportation, like, think about how those conversations would go. Because we're like, you're asking me to be the first person to try your teleportation product? <laughs> Um, I'm gonna opt out, right? So it's like the idea is in fact great, and yet no one will be free. Like, gosh, how many of you have worked on a product that if everybody already used it, it would be amazing, but getting the first person is impossible? I mean, you don't have to raise your hands, but I've done it. I mean, this classic startup error. 
teleportation would be one of those products. So like, then, okay, let's say 10 out of 10 customers are like, no. Now, is your vision flawed? Listen, if any of you are working on teleportation right now and have working teleportation in the lab, please do not give up because the first 10 people don't want to do it. But do think about, gosh, how on earth are we going to commercialize this thing? How am I going to convince people to be the first person? Like, there's huge, difficult questions that have to be answered. And the energy that you and your co-founder, not you, but one and one's co-founder spend arguing with each other is not actually productive energy. I wish I could have every one of those hours back so we could focus our energy on, okay, hold on. How do we make this vision work for customers? Now, the stories you've told about the 50 people and the 51st person it works, every one of those stories has a very specific character, which is that people are trying to unlock some resource from a gatekeeper. Right, J.K. Rowling and the publishers who just said no to Harry Potter, like, I mean, people have their favorite version of that story. But real life, except when you're raising money in a startup, most of the time you're working, you're not really trying to unlock a gatekeeper. So um, you don't have to worry about this problem that gatekeepers herd together and all kind of make the same decision because they all have a same shared bias. Like, customers don't generally work that way. The partnership person who has a partnership question is going to have this problem. So you're exempted. But everybody else, including all the people who think they have a partnership problem but don't, you can stop wasting your time on this and trying to figure out, like, look, who's the customer for this and what do they really want? And then how do we run those experiments to figure it out? Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Sadly, it is 8 o'clock, which oh my God. they have already noted, and I had too. I was hoping for maybe one last question, but we really don't because there's also some other part to this evening, which is Eric will very kindly be signing books, and their books are, as you walk out, there's a table to buy the books, and then Eric will be at a table where he can sign the books. So I want to thank everybody for their kind attention and thank Eric. <laughs>